Welcome to my presentation. My name is Maximilian Staudacher and I am a PhD candidate at the Montana Universität Leoben in Austria. My work mostly revolves around mechanical characterization and today I'm going to talk about the ball and free balls test and its comparison to the ring on ring test. So what was the aim of our work? The major goals of our investigation was to find out whether the strength measured with the ball and free balls test or the ring on ring test are comparable. Additionally, we wanted to know how the friction conditions during testing influence strength and how an uneven loading might influence the results. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the investigated bikes and methods, and then I will briefly introduce the experimental methods, the investigated materials and the utilized intermediate layers. Then I will discuss the results and whether or not the comparison is valid before going into more detail about friction and uneven loading with finite element analysis. In the end, I will sum up our results and give a little outlook on what our future work will or might actually be. As I already mentioned, we took a closer look at the ball and free balls test and the ring and ring test. As the name already implies, the ball and free balls test uses three supporting balls and a single loading ball. To apply a biaxial stress field with a typical three fold symmetry on the specimen. To reduce contact stresses, a large ball diameter, which is about 50% of the specimen diameter, was used. On the other hand, the ring on ring test utilizes two coaxial rings, so that's a supporting ring and a loading ring, and applies a fully rotationally symmetric stress field. You can already see the big difference in size of the region of maximum stress between both of these methods, which has quite an influence on the measured strength and we'll go further into detail later on. A testing rig for the ball and free balls test typically looks something like this, with the ball assembly actually being upside down. For testing, you apply a preload, then remove the block over here and let the guide slide down and then start the actual loading until failure. The ring and ring test is quite simple as well, except that some sort of intermediate layers or lubricants are called for by the standards. They're usually applied on both sample sites in order to reduce friction and to avoid friction induced contact failure. Now, how do we compare these methods? According to viable theory, there's a relationship between effective volume and characteristic strength commonly known as the size effect. So in theory, if samples exhibit lower strength, if they were tested with a high effective volume, and thus this can be seen over here. Now, if all data points are displayed on a double logarithmic graph, the slope of a linear fit can be converted to some sort of fiber modulus. If the fitted viable modulus and the viable moduli of the single sets are equal, then they follow the formula up here, uh, which results in the case that each characteristic strength can be converted to the effective volume of the other testing method and vice versa. As a note, in our case, failure was mostly determined by surface flaws, and instead of effective volume, we used the effective surface, but the same principle still applies. Overall, we tested several geometries and different layers to get a good understanding about how these variations might influence the comparison. The material we tested was called friolite, which is alumina with a small amount of magnesium oxide. It was sourced from Curacera in Germany, and we received two rods of different diameter, which were cut into discs at our own facility. Since we found a significant difference in microstructure and mechanical properties between those two rods, we treated them as separate materials. For testing, we used four different intermediate layers to reduce friction. An adhesive Teflon tape, a loose Teflon foil, an adhesive polyethylene tape, which will be called glue tape for on, and some thicker latex rubber, which was sourced from green TheraBand. On the next slides, you will see different endings for the various data and set names, with the ending T referring to the Teflon tape, the ending BT referring to the blue tape, and the ending 2G referring for rubber on both sample sides. In the case of blue tape and T, the loose Teflon tape was used on the tension-loaded side. 
So here are the results for us, our 17 millimeter samples with a typical viable plot. Now, if you want to compare the fitted model from the size effect plot with the model on this graph, it might be hard to spot the models of each set. Therefore, we chose a different style of graph to display both the viable modulus and characteristic strength for each set, as well as the 90% confidence intervals. Now we can see that the fitted modulus from the right graph, so from the size effect plot, which is about 20, is in alignment or good alignment with most data sets on the left. In general, if tested correctly, the ball and free balls and the ring on ring samples should exhibit a difference in effective surface and in strength. As can be seen, the ball of ball samples exhibit a way lower effective surface than the ring on ring samples with about two magnitudes in between them. The strength is also separated by quite a margin as can be seen over here. However, some of these results don't really fit in. So first, there is this set with a very high modulus of samples tested with two rubber sheets which is why we didn't really use them for them. And then there's this specific data set. It was not included in the linear fit since the Teflon tape started to rupture just before failure, which resulted in two peaks close to the maximum load and unknown friction conditions at failure. It, the samples looked something like this after testing, which is why we would not recommend using this specific tape for high loads. For the other diameter, the fitted viable modulus of about 30 is once again in very good agreement with the single data sets over here. However, there were two data sets that were not taken into account for the fit. The first one is the ball and free ball set that was tested with a compliant layer. So it was tested with blue tape on the compressive side. And it shows quite an increase in strength compared to other ball and free ball samples with the exact same geometry. The other set is a ring and ring sample that was tested without any layers, which is both lacking in strength and viral modulus. A further observation was the data sets which were tested with either Teflon tape or blue tape were not distinguishable from each other. Before we move on to the second part of this presentation, I want to sum up all conclusions so far. So first of all, both methods vary quite a lot in tested effective surface and volume. And second, the Teflon tapes are at a risk of rupture before specimen failure and should therefore not be used for high loads. Third, there is no difference in strength between the Teflon and the blue tape samples. So the blue tape is a good alternative to a Teflon tape. And as we have just seen, Ball and free ball samples with layers show an unusually high strength and ring and ring samples without any layers show quite a low strength. In order to explain the high strength of ball and free ball samples with layers, we have to look at how factor strength is calculated. We can see that the factor F over here plays an important role as most geometric variations apart from the thickness T are included in it. Now, if we look at the factor F independence of the contact radius, we can see that if the contact radius increases, the factor F decreases. According to the formula up here, if specimens always fail at a similar fracture stress, then the failure load has to increase to compensate for a decreased F. However, if we still use the factor F for an ideal pointwise load, so which would be about here, then the increased maximum load leads to a seemingly high strength which explains why we found the results on the previous slides. So now we have to explain the low strength of ring on ring samples without any layers. As I mentioned before, these layers should reduce friction between sample and loading feature. So our first intention was that friction, which should now be increased due to none of the layers being present, lowers the measured strength. To validate this idea, we used a 2D finite element model in ANSYS which corresponds to the 28 millimeter samples where we first saw this effect. Since we do not know the coefficient of friction between sample and ring, we looked at four extreme cases with the assumption that the real conditions would be somewhere in between. The first case we simulated was with no friction at all, meaning that all horizontal movement was allowed on both contact points. 
Then we completely fix the loading ring to the sample by limiting, limiting the horizontal movement at load introduction to zero. And then we did the same thing just for the supporting ring. And finally, we fixed both rings horizontally. So these are the results for each case. And I will spare you with the exact details for each case and move straight to the most important finding which is the large difference in maximum stress between case one with no friction and case four with both rings fixed. The maximum stress decreases to about one third if friction is taken into account. And the similar behavior was observed for the other cases, but not quite to the same extent. And therefore we can assume that frictions always decreases the maximum stress. Now, if it has a specimen with friction, the maximum stress decreases and a higher load would be necessary for specimen failure. This means that an apparently higher strength should be measured, which sadly was the exact opposite of what we observed. So since friction could not explain the decrease in strength, we looked for some other explanations. And one possible explanation might be uneven loading. So due to the lack of layers, small misalignments or machining, machining inaccuracies between the ring and the specimen, might not be compensated and instead of a perfect line contact, multiple contact points might be closer to the actual reality, which could lead to the sort of the decrease in strength. So to verify this, we used finite element analysis again, but this time with a three-dimensional model. Once again, the model corresponds to 28 millimeter samples, but this time friction was not taken into account. And to further simplify the problem, instead of contact calculations, an oscillating load was applied to simulate multiple contact points, uh, which followed following the formula, which is shown here. And so in the code, we could change the parameters A and Z, which is the amplitude of the oscillation and the number of maxima as seen here. We ran the code for about 50 variations of both parameters in order to see how the number of contact points and the amplitude influence the stress field. And the following results are all relevant for the maximum load oscillation, meaning that instead of a constant load in the ideal case, the load will vary between zero and two times that constant load, but overall it will add up to the same total. And the dashed red lines mark the positions of the loading ring and the supporting ring and the black lines marks the positions of the paths along which the stress was evaluated into more detail, and you will see those relations in the upcoming slides. It, now, if you compare the ideal case and the, to the case of five maxima, it is quite clear to see that zones of higher stress around the simulated contact points appear, and they appear both in the tangential and the radial stress components. Now, if you take a closer look at the paths through the positions of maximum stress, we can see that there's a significant increase in stress in the contact zone between the loading ring and the specimen. Now, if the number of contact points is, for, is increased further, the ideal case is approached, with, which is what was to be expected. Now, if stress maxima at the loading ring occur, there should be a higher number of fracture origins in those regions. And after doing a lot of fractography, we found a significant difference in positions of the fracture origins. We can see here that if no layer is used, the number of fracture origins in the center regions decrease and they can instead be found in or close to the contact zones. And once again, we can see that there's hardly any difference in statistics between the samples tested with blue tape or the Teflon tape. And the typical central fracture looks like this, whereas loading ring fractures on the, in the contact zones look like this. So in summary, a comparison of the strength measured with either the ball and free balls or the ring on ring test is valid, as long as the material behaves according to viable theory and some care is taken when choosing the appropriate layers, which was seen when in the case where lay layers were used in the ball and free balls test and were not taken into account properly with the factor F, or when no layers were used for the ring and ring test and quite low strengths were measured. So contrary to our initial assumption, friction could not explain the lower strength of this data set, but uneven loading could due to the occurrence of zones of increased stress. <laughs>
And these zones of increased stress were located close to the conflict zones between specimen and loading ring. And a higher number of fracture origins was found in these regions, which helps to validate our claims. Now, the next steps will be to take a closer look at the surface of the loading and supporting rings, as we did here with a laser confocal microscope, and then transfer those, this data into a finite element analysis program to more accurately simulate the real situation. Also, we are in the process of testing more and more materials with different geometries and different intermediate layers to see if our assumptions will still hold true. Finally, I want to thank the Austrian government and the European Research Council for financing this work. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or post them in the chat. Thank you.